Well, it seems you can't get enough of Mac Studio content, so today I'm going to be answering your questions about the Apple Mac Studio. Why don't you join me? Well, it's time once again to address your questions, comments, and concerns. If you have one of those three things, well, you've come to the right place. Uh, before we get started, as always, I want to welcome my good friends in the cheap seats. It seems the faster your computer gets, the less interesting you get. Well, you came here anyways. It was either that or a colonoscopy. I think I chose wrong. Really, some things never change. Like your underwear. <laughs> anyways, let's start with an update. quite an update, but an observation. Uh, I know some of you that have ordered your Mac Studios are still waiting for them. Uh, I was fortunate to order it on the first day and I got to uh, delivery pretty early, but uh, I do know some people that have ordered theirs and there was a month delay. Uh, the funny thing is, while you've been waiting for your Mac Studio, uh, M2 is now a reality. Uh, I'm reading here in the Apple rumors that they're already talking about the possibility of an M3. So I'm kind of wondering if you've ordered yours and you're waiting, or perhaps uh, you haven't ordered one yet, or maybe you're like me and you've already ordered one. I'm wondering how you're feeling about the announcement of these other chips. Are you starting to feel like, hold on a second, this was supposed to be the latest and greatest, and three months later, there's already an M2, possibly an M3 down the road. Now, the M1 Ultra chip is the only dual chip. Uh, the M2 uh, is currently only a single chip, which shipping with some of the other Apple products. Um, now, I'm certain once they announce a Mac Pro, I think that's the first time we're going to see a new dual chip, an M2 Ultra, M3, or something like that. So the M1 Ultra is still the most powerful chip out there, but we've got some new numbers out there. But I'm wondering how you're feeling. If you've already purchased, maybe you're waiting to purchase. Is that going to hold you off a little bit to see what's coming? And if you're still waiting <laughs> to take delivery of yours and they've announced a new chip while you've been waiting, I'd really like to know how you're feeling about that. All of today's questions originate in videos that I've placed in our special playlist. That's QCC number seven, and it's all things Mac Studio. Link to that is in the description. So first up, we have a comment from Robert L. He writes, Boy, I'm a 61-year-old sound engineer. We did great records with 24 tracks, with some eight to two bounces, and in some occasions, like a drum kit mixed on stereo to free up some tracks for overdubs. If we didn't have any synchronized external gear, that made a total of 30 tracks. Still wonder if today's 130 tracks sound better than our projects. Absolutely love this comment. Want to thank Robert L for writing. You know, I have this conversation with my friends because working in a DAW, there's virtually no limitations. Now, working in an actual studio, there are physical limitations. I mean, you've got a, a limited number of effects. You've got a limit, limited number of tracks to, to work with. And I think those limitations actually enhance creativity because when you have no limits, you can just keep going and going and going. But if there's an actual physical limitation, I think that sort of puts your mind on the right track and allows you to be really, really creative because you have to work with what you have. And it's something that I've been trying to practice in my own mixes is, is that even though I have unlimited access to any number of compressors or you know reverbs and things like that, is I'm really trying to limit myself and really enhance the creativity that comes out of me because I think too much is actually a hindrance to creativity. And uh, I really strongly do believe that. And it's something I think worth trying. I mean, just because you have access to an unlimited number of resources doesn't mean you have to use them all. So next up is a question that relates to the video uh, that I did on when I migrated from my old computer to the new Apple Mac Studio. It comes from Eric Batter. So when you migrated everything over to the new Mac, how did you transfer all of your plugins over properly to work with existing projects? Any hiccups? Do you have a step-by-step -step process on how to go about doing this for each plugin maker? Thanks, liked and sub to you. That's a great question, Eric. Now, the thing is when I migrated to my new computer, I went into it wanting to streamline things a little bit. I just had so many plugins installed in my system. I just wanted to streamline that. I just don't use all of the plugins that I have. Uh, I ran into some issues with my Waves plugins. I talked about that a lot. I'm not gonna go into that in this video, but I decided to move on from Waves. Uh, now, in terms of compatibility with old projects, I kind of finished some things that I was working on and then I moved on, but really my whole plan for my migration was to start clean and install everything one by one. Uh, I started with the, the group of plugins that I knew I was gonna use. And from there, if I opened up a project or there was something that I reached for that wasn't there, then I'd go and, I, and I'd install it then. So it's not like I just did a mass install of everything. I just installed everything manually one by one. I mean, Apple does have the migration tool, but I didn't want to inherit old problems. So I felt start with a clean machine 
clean hard drive and just start installing things as I needed them. And that's worked really well for me. Ah, it seems my brother-in-law decided to check in. Hey Dan, it's Ian Cohen. Yes, my brother-in-law Ian, who has appeared on this channel a couple of times, had a question for me and he wrote, Wow, what a lot of work to migrate all of your software over. I hope the new Mac's horsepower and speed is worth it. I'm sure you'll let us know. Thanks. Well, you know what? It's a good question. I mean, everyone wants to know, is the new Mac Studio everything that it claims to be? Now, look, it's a new computer with new architecture. It's a lot faster. And if you're comparing it to an old computer, well, I had a lot of problems with my old computer and the new computer has solved a lot of my issues. But it's kind of like, you know, opening your pants after a big meal. You know, you, you got a lot of room, but maybe not as much as you thought. The thing about working on the new Mac Studio is I forget sometimes because like one example, rendering one of my, my episodes here at my YouTube channel sometimes would take 20 minutes on my old machine and now it's a minute and a half. I mean, you can do all the benchmarks you want, but saving, you know, 18 and a half minutes every time I render something, that's big for me. Uh, but there are some things, some hiccups, as you would call them, that I have noticed along the way. I've talked about it in a couple of my other videos, but I don't know if it's, even though some software has been optimized for M1, I've learned that optimized doesn't mean native. And just because it's native doesn't mean it's truly optimizing the new chipset. Uh, because I'm getting the odd crashes, weird crashes. Um, one thing I have figured out is, for example, Logic Pro running natively M1 and then having plugins that are running in Rosetta. That definitely slows things down as was made evident in some of the speed tests that I've done here. Uh, but something else that someone brought to my attention, and actually I'll be talking about that in a second, is that having Logic running in M1 and plugins running in Rosetta, there's a mismatch there. And that's definitely something that I've seen happen. Uh, a lot of weird crashes when I'm using plugins that are not M1 native. And uh, sometimes I just it's just something that I need. I'm trying to phase those out. And uh, on the video side, I'm finding sometimes real-time playback is not as real-time as it should be. And again, I don't know if it's the software not optimizing properly for the, the new chip. Perhaps things will get better. It's definitely a lot better than it used to be, and my productivity is way, way up compared to what it to was before. But it's not perfect. There are some hiccups there, and uh, hopefully these things will improve as the software catches up uh, to the new chips. Now, speaking of that M1 Rosetta mismatch, uh, I've got a comment from Tim Beaton. Nice to see a musician testing these out. Makes a pleasant change from channels that only check video performance, and of course, the ones that merely run benchmarks. Interesting on the track count. I wonder if any of the instruments were using Rosetta. Always worth checking out, as that will always add quite a bit of load to the CPU. Uh, thanks, Tim, for that comment. In fact, that's something that set me straight. Uh, I did a test video, my first test video, where I got about 150 tracks in a project, which is more than I'll ever need in a project. But it was sort of underwhelming because, because I thought the, the, the Mac Studio could handle a lot more than that. And actually, this was the comment that got me thinking that I need to revisit that test. And he was right that, you know, that mismatch between, you know, Rosetta and M1 Native. So I ran the test again to see how many tracks I can stack in one project. But this time, I was mindful that Rosetta was not running anything Rosetta. I quit it. So it was Logic Pro running natively in M1. And any plugins I used in that test were native M1. And we got that to over 500 tracks. It made a huge difference. Now, how realistic is that? Well, number one, I'll never need 500 tracks. But, you know, not all applications are M1 native yet, and there may be some applications, plugins, things like that, that are integral to your workflow. So if you're not expecting 500 tracks, it's really not a problem, but there definitely is a performance difference when you're running everything native in M1, or if you're combining some things in Rosetta and in M and M1. And again, I've noticed that with Logic Pro is that sometimes it just crashes and some projects just won't open properly if there are plugins, that, you know, if there are plugins in there that are not native M1. So uh, again, this is something I'm trying to flush out. I'm hoping some of these plugins will eventually catch up. They all will eventually, uh, but it's, simply, it's definitely something to be mindful of uh, when you're moving over to the new Mac Studio. So next up, we've got uh, one here that looks like it's a little bit of a concern. Frank R. Ice Cold Productions wrote, Nice video, man. I'm still having a problem and conflicted on the Mac Studio having everything being hardwired and no upgradability. What you get, you're stuck with. I'm waiting to see what they're going to do with the new Mac Pro and see if there'll be upgradability or not. I'm not gonna hold my breath, though I don't mind paying more for a Mac Pro, but it's gonna to have to last me eight to 10 years. We'll see, thanks for the video. Well, that's just the reality of using Apple computers today. I mean, Apple has pretty much defined everything. I mean, the Mac Pros, when they eventually come out, as was made evident with the last Mac Pros in 2019, they're really, really expensive. Apple seems, it just seems like they don't want us inside of their machines, it's just, you know, limited upgradability. I know on the iMac, I think you could upgrade the RAM, or at least on the last one. 
but it just seems Apple doesn't want us inside. And um, that's just the reality of using a Mac. And I personally don't think that's going to change. I mean, just look at their product lines. The iMacs are going to have limited uh, upgradability. Uh, the Mac Studios, there's really no upgradability. Maybe people will figure out that hard drive situation. But again, it'll be very limited if that's possible. And the Mac Pros will have full upgradability, but they're going to be hugely expensive. And that's really what Apple's decided to do. Now, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what the new Mac Pros are going to look like. But since they're catered to the most pro of professionals, uh, there's going to be a price tag attached to that. Now, there's so much horsepower in these new machines that they're not going to be redundant in a year. I mean, my Mac Pro trash can, I mean, I used that thing. It was, it was a nine-year-old machine, and it was still doing the job. Not great, but it was still doing the job. Uh, these new machines are just super fast. And I think we've reached that point where I think it's going to take a long time for it to become redundant if what you're doing now is similar to what you're going to be doing in the not too distant future. So I'm anticipating at least five years, probably we'll get more than that. But uh, I think if you're using it for fun, well, you know, just manage your expectations. If you're a professional and you're not looking to spend, you know, on a Mac Pro, which is going to be hugely expensive. I mean, the Mac Studio is a good solution, and I think it's going to buy you quite a bit of runway. I say at least five years, but it'll probably be more than that. And in terms of upgrading it, well, that's just the cost of using a Mac these days, and there's not much we can do about it. Well, it seems we have a disgruntled commenter. Bonzology3 writes, When are you guys going to figure out that track count is a useless measure? Virtual instruments are memory hogs, not CPU. It takes no CPU power. Load up linear phase EQs and see what the CPU can do in native use, or it's just a waste of time. All right, Mr. Bonzology. First of all, it's not a waste of time. Now, track count is very relative because you are loading up numerous virtual instruments, plugins, different EQs. People are curious what these machines can do. And there is a limit. You know, if it, if it didn't matter, then these machines wouldn't cap out. And these machines definitely did cap out. Um, I proved that in my tests where, okay, I was using things in Rosetta, but it was a big difference between that and running everything natively. Now, people just want to get an idea of what they're going to be able to do with these machines. You know, I'm not doing tests here that are going to get published in a white paper. They're just designed to give average users the idea, an idea of what they can expect from these machines. So honestly, I think your knowledge exceeds your usefulness, at least on this channel, because I know, I know most people who um, watch those videos got some value out of those tests. And... Uh, and here's what it is. Who's calling me in the middle of a show? Jesus Christ is calling me? I'm not kidding. Uh, I got a comment here from a guy whose name is Jesus Christ is calling you. And he wrote, I don't think I've totaled 550 tracks combined in all of my projects in 20 years of this music making hobby. I think that's the most enlightening thing that we've heard all day. You know, people are so impressed by numbers, you know, 500 tracks, 1,000 tracks. Honestly, I make music and I've got an average of 30 to 50 tracks. Uh, if you're putting uh, two, three, 400 tracks in your projects and you're not recording and mi mixing symphonies, I think you might want to go see a psychiatrist. Well, we finally arrived at the last question. So the last one is actually a statement, but it relates to my mulling over of my purchase of the Mac Studio, because coming to the realization that Apple doesn't want us inside of those machines unless you buy a Mac Pro, because pretty much everything else, it, you get what you get. You just, you can't tweak them, you can't upgrade them. And I just decided that I had no choice. I needed a computer now and the Mac Studio offered what I needed to kind of keep my venture going here. And I really felt there were no other options, but, uh, Mr. Unsane had a suggestion and he wrote, You asked what choice do you have? Hackintosh. You know, I think it's safe to say the concept of the Hackintosh is dead. Apple's making their own chips. I don't think they're going to be selling them uh, on the open market. Yeah, maybe you can reclaim them from old machines, but the idea of building a super Mac computer that's not made by Apple, I actually think that concept is dead. Disagree with me? Let me know in the comments. Well, that brings us to the end of another video. I want to thank you so much for all of your questions, your comments and concerns. If you've got any of those things and you want to contribute to one of these shows, just leave a comment somewhere. Uh, you can leave it in the uh, comment section of this video, but I do go looking through all of the videos on my channel. Anything that catches my eye, well, then I might just feature it here on the show. Uh, I do want to thank my good friends in the Cheap Seats for joining me today. Cheap ain't cheap enough. Really. 
Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that bell. If you want to do a deeper dive with me, I'm on Patreon. I have affiliate links. I even have merch. All of that information is down below. But the most important thing is to check out another video. I've got one waiting for you right here. And remember, you don't need a band to rock and roll. And I look forward to seeing you again in another video.